Welcome to Ingenious Talks Online, Modeling COVID-19 Using Spatial Modeling and Simulation. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. So my name is Laura Kilpatrick and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's event where we're just gonna start out with a few housekeeping items. So first off, this is a Zoom webinar, which does mean that all attendee microphones and videos have been disabled. However, you do have the option to um, ask a question by typing in the Q&A box on your screen. While questions will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation, we do highly encourage you to type them as they come to mind. So you do not need to wait until the Q&A section to um, submit your question. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but please be mindful that with a high volume of questions, we cannot guarantee that all will be answered. Uh, we also encourage you to chat amongst each other during the presentation using the chat box. So today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted to Carlton's YouTube channel post-event. And finally, um, at the end of the webinar, you will see a um, survey pop up on your screen. So if you do have the time right then and there to fill it out, we'd really appreciate it. Um, but please know that all event attendees will receive a duplicate survey via email post-event. So we really do welcome and appreciate your feedback and all submissions are anonymous. Okay, now I'm pleased to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Gabriel Weiner. So Dr. Weiner is the director of Carleton University's Advanced Real-Time Simulation Lab and has been a professor in the Department of Systems and Computer Engineering for over 20 years. Dr. Weiner is a fellow of the Society for Modeling and Simulation International and recently was awarded um, their Outstanding Service Award for 2020. He's also the special issues editor of simulation and a member of the editorial boards for IEEE's Computing in Science and Engineering, Wireless Networks, and Journal of Defense Modeling and Simulation. Dr. Weiner recently, re recently received a Carleton University COVID-19 Rapid Research Response Grant, as well as two NSERC Alliance COVID grants to work on the same issue. Today, Dr. Weiner will explore how researchers at Carleton University's Advanced Real-Time Simulation Lab have developed new methods to define complex models, including the spread of diseases, using a space-based approach. Thank you, Dr. Weiner, and now I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Laura. Thanks for the invitation uh, to the Faculty of Engineering. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. We are going to try to share the recent result of our research. I'm going to start sharing my screen in a second. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, so as uh, Laura explained, I'm a professor at the Department of Systems and Computer Engineering and I'm the head of the Advanced Real-Time Simulation Lab. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about how to model COVID-19 using some things that we invented in the lab which are called spatial modeling and simulation. As Laura uh, told me, there is a varied audience. So I'm going to give a presentation in very high terms, very high level um, and uh, with plain language when possible. I will try not to be too technical. That being said, we always start with, uh, so what do you do in your lab? What, what is it, what you do? Well, uh, I'm an expert in what's called discrete event modeling and simulation methodologies. Uh, my work is in developing new methods for distributed parallel and uh, real-time simulation. And my research team is uh, focusing since uh, 97 on advanced uh, theoretical modeling techniques. So I think that was pretty clear, right? So uh, the good thing about Zoom is that I cannot uh, see the disappointment faces uh, when I joke about stuff. Uh, so let's try to do this a bit uh, higher level because we are always asked, okay, uh, explain me your research and I have 20 seconds. People are super busy and they need a 20 second answer. So what is, what is it what we do in the advanced real-time simulation lab? Basically, we get a computer and we try to reproduce behavior that we see in the real world. And then uh, I'm an expert in the methods to do that, okay? So people tell me what is the application. We have lots of applications, COVID is one of them. 
we're focusing on the methods to do things faster, better, and cheaper. So an example here, uh, so uh, uh, recently we had an attack in uh, Rideau Hall, so we could simulate surveillance and uh, detection of uh, strangers in Rideau Hall without harming anybody, that's an example. We're in a pandemic, there are no marathons, we could run a virtual one. So the one in the bottom is what we do to try to reproduce, reproduce what you see above. And why is this important? Well, uh, it's uh, widely used in science and it's moving to uh, industry. It's, it, there have been even articles on Forbes magazine. Um, beyond business, uh, right now, it's one of my, the main driver, uh, uh, drivers on, on pandemic, mod, uh, pandemic uh, studies. Uh, so pandem pandemic modeling and simulation has been on the forefront of the news for a while. I hope that this was a bit clearer, and this is what we do in the lab. Let's uh, talk about the COVID-19 uh, story and why modeling and simulation is so important. We learn about the world around us through experimentation. This is not new. We have been doing this uh, since the beginning of uh, you know, knowledge uh, acquisition. We have thousands of years of learning through experimentation. And, uh, and we still do this, even on the COVID scenario. Uh, we have to conduct experiments to know uh, about the disease and how the disease spreads. This ends up being, uh, we can try to formalize the experimentation, experimentation process. This is a very high level description of what we do. So we have an entity, it's a virus, for instance. And we conduct experiments on the virus. Okay? Uh, we try to attack it with different medication. We put it in different uh, petri dishes and conduct different experiments and see what happens. Uh, and uh, we call that the experimental frame. We conduct experiments, we collect results. And uh, if we are lucky, we are done. Now we have a cure for the virus, okay? The big problem with this is that pure experimentation is very limited. And let me discuss why. One of the main reasons is ethics, right? So in particular, in the case of, uh, of a pandemic or a virus, we cannot infect people to see what happens, right? So ethics is major. It's also risky or dangerous to conduct experiments. Um, so this is also a limitation for pure experimentation. Another major, major issue is cost. So building a large Haldron Collider or a neutrino observatory, it's hundreds of millions of dollars and years of uh, development, but equipment for analysis of COVID is also expensive. And a pandemic and different systems around the world, uh, well, they have a combination of all of them. So it's risky, it's expensive. You cannot conduct experiments, it's unethical. Uh, so experimentation is not a good solution to try to deal with a big problem like this one. So what do we do about it? Well, we know more or less what we do. What we do. We still conduct some experiments and we collect some results. We don't have the money or it's risky to do many of them. Well, we build something that we call a, we call a model. What's a model? It's some kind of mathematical representation of what we see in the real world. And then we can ask lots of questions to the model without risk, without ethical problems. It's a piece of mathematics on a piece of paper and you can think about it, you can reason on them. It's a symbolic method, you manipulate symbols, you are not dealing with people. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing of a model is that it will give you a general solution to the physical world problem you, you want to study. So for instance, uh, if I have it, correct and complete model for COVID, I could say from now until September, exactly what's going to happen all over the world, okay? The problem is that models are always incomplete. We, when we move from the real world that we experiment to a model that we build, we lose a lot of information. In, and this is a, an abstraction process in which we lose a lot of the information that the real world has. We cannot ever write and solve a complete model. And 
solving, if we would be able to solve a complete model on the pandemics, we would be able to tell everything about it and we could predict everything that we want, but that's not possible. The good thing about analytical modeling is that we have a lot of experience with it. So um, here you will see, uh, this is a copy of the, of the Amosé papyrus. It's uh, from 1650 before Christ. And over there, it's, there's a, an equation with an X value. There's an X equals something over there. There is the first time in history that we have documentation of a real equation. But this is pretty old, okay? So we've been doing this for a long time. It was uh, formalized to study nature by Newton and Leibniz around 1700. So we have good mathematical tools that have been used for centuries, okay? So we have, we have used those methods for the flattening the curve uh, problem that we have. So we have heard the thought, what does it mean? Well, the idea is that you see this uh, red curve in, at the bottom, uh, we need it to be below our uh, medical system to be able to deal with the pandemic and treat everybody. So as you can see, 1937, uh, Kermack and McKendrick invented this model, which is called a compartmental model, in which you define groups of people, those who are susceptible to the disease, those who got infected by the disease, and those who uh, are recovered uh, after the infection, okay? And they wrote a differential equation model that is very simple to define. And we have seen this model everywhere uh, in uh, you know, politician uh, talks all over the world. Uh, and Angela Merkel was talking about this model. Um, but this is what we want to do when we flatten the curve. We want to get this peak and make it as close as zero as possible and spread out the disease so we can handle the, uh, the pandemic in a proper way. So what do we do? Well, we get this compartmental model, we write the equations and we solve the equations. This is completely doable and easy to do. We do it every day. But that this model, as I told you, is incomplete. This does not represent the pandemic completely. Okay? It represents three things, how people get infected and how they recover. That's it. It doesn't have movement of people, okay? Uh, doesn't consider like in this current pandemic uh, asymptomatic cases. It's a macro level modeling. It, it's going to model a large population. It's going to see how the, uh, uh, this is going to evolve in that population. So we want to know how the beds in Ottawa are going to be filled out. This is a good model to, to begin with but it's macro. We don't have individual interactions. We, we cannot model here people that are disobedient or decide to not do physical distance or uh, wear masks, okay? Not, none of this is in the model. What happens if we ever start vaccinating people? How will this affect the result of uh, uh, our compartmental model uh, analysis? How about quarantines, okay? So there are millions of variables that uh, we can apply on the real world that this original model doesn't have, okay? Well, it's a very, it's a very old model. It's from 1927, the first time it was used. And in 100 years, well, we probably learned a lot, right? Well, it seems we didn't learn much, right? Uh, so we still have anti-mask meetings and then uh, the policies by Trump, Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, and uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, for the uh, pandemic in 1918 are pretty similar. And Putin has been doing military um, uh, parades uh, in the last week, like it happened in the 20s after the war, and people are fighting the, war, the using of masks. Uh, so it seems that we have not learned a lot, but in fact, we did, we learned a lot. So. Uh, remember that we started with this simple model that has three basic equations. Well, the models look, look more like this stuff over here. It's, it's way more complicated. And we have included a lot of interesting things in the models. And these models are being used every day. But they have a problem. They are too complex to solve analytically. When you want to solve the thing on the corner with mathematics, it's simple. When you want to solve this with mathematics, you cannot do it. This is even worse. So what do you do? There's another solution for that. 
So uh, until now, what we do is we conduct experiments on an entity, we collect some data. From that data, we build a model that tries to copy what we see in the real world, and we ask questions to the model. The model is so complicated that cannot be solved, so it doesn't give me any answer. What do I do? I approximate the model again through a computation that is going to give me individual results in certain points. Remember that the model will give me, would, would give me all of the possible solutions uh, from now until forever, okay? Well, this computation is going to answer one question. Can I improve wearing, by wearing masks? For instance, it's something that we could try to, um, to ask. And then what we, what we do is we would compute approximations of what the complex equation does at points in time. So what happened to if, if the model with masks uh, is computed every 20 minutes for two weeks? So can I predict if the wearing of, of masks is going to reduce the spread of the disease? So that's the question I want to ask. If I wear masks, uh, can I get some results that will tell me uh, that it's going to be useful or not. And for doing that, we do approximations every 15 minutes for two weeks. We don't solve a very complex problem to perfection from now until forever with every possible precision. We have one solution to that one problem. And this is also a very old um, uh, uh, method to solve this problem. We know how to do this since the 1700s when Newton and Leibniz defined uh, the, uh, the, the um, uh, calculus uh, immediately them and other mathematicians like Taylor here, uh, they started to build up this called numerical methods to simulate what the model is going to be doing. So we call this a simulation. It's a computation of what the model does. Now, as you can imagine in 1700, this computation was a person with pen and paper, right? or some, some, someone doing some basic math on, on points, and, and this was pretty inaccurate, and it took forever, but it could be done. So uh, science evolved in, in the last uh, 400 years through these methods. But then this happened. We got computers, okay? So we started with uh, experimental scientists that do analysis on an entity, the virus, let's say, and they collect some basic results. They want to know more. Therefore, they don't have the money or they cannot do it because it's unethical or risky. They do the model and they try to solve everything that they can in the model. And they learn a lot with the model, but eventually when you ask the model, that it doesn't answer anymore your questions. So what do we do is a computation and then we put a computer here, okay? So we can get a computed query and get approximate results. If we follow this method, everything goes pretty well. But unfortunately, we move from a very sound, precise, uh, mathematically proven technique to this. We get the data, somebody sits down in a computer, they write a program that it's called a simulator and this, this work, they, uh, they ask questions to the simulation results and they get some results. So, uh, this is brand new stuff. It started in the 1950s, okay? And this is where our research is about. Uh, what happened is that uh, uh, the evolution of simulation moved from a sound technique to something that based on tools, simulation languages, statistical pa packages, computer libraries, visualization tools, standards. It's all software-based. It's an informal approach. It has lots of problems that I'm not going to talk about today, but this is good for me because this is where my research is about, okay? So what we want to do is we want to stop doing this and we want to go back to something like that, that it's more serious and more formal. And we've been doing this for a while with success. So why is this so complex? Take a look at this, okay? This is extracted from the weekly report of Public Canada Modeling Group. These were updates from last week. This is the data that's happening, that's being collected through new experimental studies, okay? So there are 70, 72 additional studies in one week for case fatality rates. There are perfection fatality rates. There are cases for asymptomatics, 24 more studies. 
three studies for incubation period, four new studies for infectious period. There are, so there are pages and pages on the new studies and they're summarized in parameters for the models and the simulations that we use. But this change every week. These numbers were very different two months ago. Why? Because we learn, learn every week. So the problem is here, these changes, and we need to do those changes quickly. We cannot start writing a new program every time because it's going to be uh, very uh, expensive in terms of time. If you talk to any of the epidemi epidemiology experts, there are large numbers of experts working to exhaustion. They work 14, 15 hours a day to try to predict uh, what the disease is going to do to give the government uh, uh, adequate data to make informed decisions, okay? And in fact, this is from today. So look at the things that science, the science mag magazine has posted today on uh, what is the research about modeling. These are, these are all the things that are changing all the time. So at the beginning, there is some information and then the, the in, in, when the intervention, inter intervention happened, all of this orange stuff need to be considered and we don't know anything about that. And so we need to adapt quickly and we need to be able to, to create new models uh, easily and quickly to, uh, uh, to have more options for studies, okay? So this is what we do in the lab. Um, in our lab, what we work on complex systems modeling and simulation, and uh, we do many different things. And one of them that is applicable to COVID modeling is what I'm going to explain briefly in the next few slides. Uh, we invented something that, uh, that's called the cell depth formalism, in which you get an area in the in the world that you want to study, let's say the city of Ottawa, and you do a mathematical model of what happens in each one of the areas. In this case, as you can see, the topology is very simple. These are squares connected to each other, but we can have any topology that we, what we want. We have formal equations that we can study on paper and think about them without programming. We don't have a, uh, a software development from scratch. We think about the problem, we write the equations, the equations with colleagues, okay? But once the equations are good, we put them quickly into a software tool that allows us to represent, okay, uh, Barhaven has these properties and now um, Manatic has these properties and let's start and see how they influence each other, okay? The cells are very simple models and then we can connect them to each other using the methods that we invented. It's very efficient because it uses something that's called asynchronous execution, uh, which basically, if you don't need to compute something, you don't, and you speed up the obtention of results. And you can do that with multiple processors to get the results even faster. And the interesting thing is that we just need to focus on the model. We don't worry about how it's simulated. Our lab works on how this is simulated. So what do we do? We get an area, let's say Ottawa. We, get, we divide it in neighborhoods. And then we get, we get each one of the neighborhoods and we say how they're going to react. And they look more or less, more or less like this. <laughs> uh, we receive disease information from the neighborhood. We are going to have an equation here that says, uh, if my level of uh, uh, um, infectiousness in this neighborhood is a certain number, and I, my two close neighbors have higher levels of disease, and people move around, I will increase the rate of disease in my neighborhood, and then I will report it to the other neighbors after a certain delay. This could consider number of people, in the neighborhood and they can consider if they are symptomatic or asymptomatic. We can put here all of the information that comes from public health fairly quickly. And, uh, and then we can run lots of simulations with ease, okay? So it was a two minute description of the method that we use. And now I'm going to give you another two minute description of how the software looks like this is a very simple example that everybody can understand. It's a theoretical model called the Bryant brain. It does nothing interesting. Uh, it's a theoretical model that people use, but this is what basically what we say. 
we say what's the size of uh, the area that we want to study. It's 400 cells by 400 cells. This, cell is, th this is how they are connected to each other. These are three by three cells around me. And these are the rules for running this model, which basically says here that um, if your cell is empty and you have exactly two neighbors to your left, so, uh, sorry, if you have two neighbors to your left, uh, you're going to, your, your cell is going to die, okay? So it's, it's reacting in a certain direction. It's a silly example, it's not very useful. But basically it says, cell to the left has a value of two, you die, okay? Your cell is alive and you have exactly two neighbors that are alive too, you remain alive. Now, after you remain alive, you're going to switch to a transient state that will die a hundred times years later. So uh, I understand that it's complicated to explain this in two seconds, but the bottom line is that we give this to students or to experts and they can write these rules in really no time. And then you get something like this. You start with Brian's brain with initial states, and then you put the simulation to run and you will start seeing emergent behavior. We don't program anything that we see in this, in, in, in this slide, in this video. We just program the individual behavior. You, you, we say, okay, there's someone on my left with a value of two and then I die. And if there are exactly two neighbors around me, I remain alive. And, and let's see what happens, okay? Uh, so many people that work on simulation, they look for this emergent behavior and they look for patterns and they try to do analysis of this. And again, this is a very simple theoretical problem, but we could adapt this to COVID. Let me tell you, our first COVID model, it's not much different than this. It's five lines longer than this. So our third model in COVID will uh, allow us to do rapid prototypes and multiple scenarios for simulation. Here we have three foci, okay? One to the, started on the top left, at the bottom down and the bottom right. <clears throat> and we have different parameters for four different simulations in terms of infectiousness and how many people would die uh, according to the parameters that the researchers in the world have conducted. And we see how it spreads out and we can uh, reconstruct the, the curves that I showed you earlier with ease. And we can build very, uh, th this kind of prototype fairly quickly. Now, uh, what the interesting part of this is that uh, as the tools give us the way of introducing new um, parameters and new rules with ease, we can end up uh, doing a wide range of studies uh, easily. So for instance, we want to, things that need to be studied right now is the influence of gender. Um, it's, there's some information, but it needs to be studied. Um, how the age groups affect this, the effect of mitigation strategies, the effect of quarantines, humidity, it seems that it, uh, affecting how uh, fast you can get sick and how you spread the viral load that you have, uh, amount of viral load around you, wearing of masks, uh, the, the, the physical distance, uh, which in North America is two meters, but in the UK it has been recommended to be one meter and in Spain it's one meter and uh, different countries play with this so we can simulate that. We can study microscopic interactions so we can put people to, to group with each other and, and see if they disobey the public health um, recommendations, uh, strategies to return to work. And this is a very nice example that we did uh, recently. Uh, so these are the curves. These are four, one, two, three, and four uh, sets of curves uh, for a study. Um, and as you can see here, we would reach the peak uh, at 42 days if we didn't include any measures, okay? And uh, so this is where the health system would be overwhelmed. We need to flatten this curve. So we started uh, experimenting with um, a method that was uh, a, a group of researchers in Israel 
and it was used uh, in, in a couple of countries already. It's called the 10-4 strategy, and it uses information that we know about the virus. It says that uh, you will be sick in, you will get the disease in four days, and then it will take you two weeks to be completely recovered, even if you are asymptomatic. So let's use this two week period and let's go to work four days. If we go to work four days nonstop, and then you go back to, ho to your house for 10 days, the only people that can get sick by you is your own family, okay? Uh, so normal work for four days, going back for home to remote work for 10 days. If in 10 days you're not sick, well, that's good. Nobody got sick at work, nobody got sick in your family, and you got four full days of full work in your company without any risk. So the simulations of, of this uh, study uh, showed that applying this simple strategy would delay the peak by 90 days. So we flattened the curve a lot with this strategy, okay? But then we said, okay, we know that people are going to disobey. Uh, since March, I've been extremely worried about um, what, uh, you know, people being frustrated by being locked down. Uh, so there's something called uh, lockdown exhaustion. What happened in, uh, in 1918 with the pandemic, we knew it's going to be happen again, and this could create a second peak. So what we said is, what happens if 20% 20, uh, 20 of the people disobey the rules? So they go to work anyway. They go out of their houses, okay? So the peak goes from 122 days to 78. What, ha what if half of the people disobey? Well, it's almost at, as having no measures at all. And the idea is that we can use our simulation tools to uh, do these kind of studies fairly quickly. And we've been doing that uh, for a while. And the good thing is that the tools we build are uh, mature and they're easy to use. So we have, uh, you might think, oh, this is work of um, top epidemiology experts uh, with years of experience. Well, we had uh, co-op students doing summer work in one week running these kind of models. And they don't work 14 hours a day. Something else that we need to do is to try to integrate with geographical information systems. So we have extracted information from OTA and we have run one of these uh, pandemic models in the city to see how they would spread and we have mixed it with the geographical information system application. We extract information from the GIS, we use it to adapt the model and then we have been doing studies from Ottawa, and uh, well, now we're, you're going to see uh, the whole province of Ontario uh, sub, and the sub, subdivisions. And uh, the, the models that I have shown earlier have been applied to this, and it's an ongoing uh, work. But as, as you can see, this, this has less than a month uh, of, of work. Um, yeah. So something else that uh, has worried our team for a long time is what happens uh, indoors. So again, since March, we have read the studies and uh, it seems that the disease spreads seriously indoors. We've known since uh, March uh, about this. And we have a, a project with uh, a group of people in the Department of Architecture, sorry, in the School of Architecture led by Stephen Fai and uh, the Department of uh, Civil Engineering led by uh, Liam O'Brien through an NSERC strategic grant. Um, we're heading into the third year of this grant. And uh, through um, architecture, we have access to building information management uh, um, models for the whole campus with a lot of detail for each one of the buildings. And we wanted to say, okay, how do we combine the spatial simulation models that we have created with the BIM model that we have? And we've been doing that. So this is uh, extracted from a BIM model. This is one of the labs in the canal building on campus. And that we want to study here is, okay, there are students 
and there's vents in the, in that we can see in the beam. And then uh, we want to study what happens with the airflow and the viral load if there's somebody sick and uh, how does the viral load spread. And then we want to study occupancy. So uh, the location of the students and uh, the humidity levels. The, uh, so I, I get this in the, this one is in the fifth floor of the canal building. And we've been running simulations for that. So there are workstations and the, the uh, blue things here are uh, vents, okay. Uh, it's divided into layers. Uh, the dots here are students working in their workstations and they will start breathing. And we want to study what happens when they breathe. So as you can see, the, the red thing is uh, the emissions of their, of, of their breath and how their breath particles spread out. It could be uh, carbon uh, dioxide, but it could carry virus. And we want to see how the ventilation affects this uh, in time. And so we've been conducting integration of the beam that we have with the simulation models. So these two correspond with each other. And we've been doing validation for this. We have moved to indoor spread of viral load. This is a house and red, the red dots are people distributed in the house and some of them are in, we are going to, they are sick and they move, they, we started with people moving around there are windows here that are open, and when the windows are open, the virus would spread slower. Uh, so we also very quickly built models like this. And thanks to uh, these um, uh, prototypes that we have, uh, we're uh, successful uh, in uh, getting one of the rapid response grants uh, funded by Carlton. Uh, we were uh, lucky and honored to be uh, given one of these grants and so we could start paying the, the students working in the summer for this. But in parallel, what happened is that uh, we applied uh, to what's called the Alliance COVID-19 by NSERP uh, with a local company that's called Soles. Uh, and uh, we started working in the project with them and also uh, with a group at DND that they are doing epidemiological models and to study what, what also what happens indoor. And through the strategic grant, uh, we have collaboration with Autodesk Research in Toronto. And so we've been trying to put together uh, all of these things. This weekend, a team of our students in the lab uh, won an award in a BIM hackathon. Uh, with our project and they, are, they continue working. Now we have uh, beams from houses and uh, people breathing around uh, carbon dioxide and viral load spreading in the house. And we started playing with uh, people moving in the buildings. Uh, keep in mind that this was funded in June for one year, okay? And we already have these results in a month. Um, um, and we already, uh, while well, the students were so uh, uh, excellent in their work that they already won an award for this. So we thank uh, the, uh, the company. So with D&D, we will work in indoor and generic models. And Solace has a middleware that collect data from uh, uh, IoT, uh, internet. So, so you, we have distributed sensors in the building. We want to use the information from the sensors and we also want to use the information that combines the uh, information from sensors and our simulators to push to users. So if students come back to campus, they could register into Solace services and get information about risky areas on campus through the simulation studies. This is what we plan to do this year. Uh, hopefully we will have results later this year. But uh, this is what we are able to do right now. So we have a beam of a building um, with lots of detail. This is, a, uh, this is an office building. And as you can see, uh, the same model that we saw a few seconds ago, you, you see here the, um, the respiration of the people sitting in the building, uh, sorry, in, in, in that floor of the building, in their cubicles uh, spread out. And uh, we are adapting this to modeling the disease. Um, this is, so what we have done here is we got the model that the architects have built. This is an office building in Brazil, one of the 
uh, hackathon te uh, team members have uh, shared this model with us during the hackathon. We have the whole campus for Carlton. We will start doing the VSIM building for experimentation uh, starting next week. And then we have other ways for visualizing this. This is transparent. We have lost a bit of the details of the walls, but you can see uh, how the, uh, the respiration is um, spread out in the building. Uh, very close areas over here will have higher concentration than open areas over there. And uh, we could uh, conduct these studies uh, fairly quickly. So to summarize, uh, I, uh, in, the, in the lab, we work on modeling and simulation, and we have been working, working on modeling and simulation of COVID-19. Uh, as a summary, what is model and mo modeling? is a method that we use to represent the behavior of a real system. In this case, the real system is the pandemic in an abstract fashion using a mathematical formal notation. And simulation is a method that we use to execute those models, in this case, the COVID models, to reach conclusions that can be applied to the real world. In this case, the real world is the pandemic and what we do control the pandemic. We do this through a very formal and well-defined mechanism in which we obtain the information that the people that conduct experimentation give to us. Uh, they conduct experiments on the actual virus and how the disease spreads out. We have some results from this that we use to build models. These models are mathematical models that I showed very br briefly today that we can study independently from anything else, and they can give us insight by themselves. By studying the math of, uh, related to these models, we can uh, predict the behavior and get good results. But when this fails, we can do another approximation, approximation find out what will happen in certain points in time. I showed you an example in which this 10 force strategy is computed once a day. That's more than enough, and we can figure out what will happen in uh, the distribution of the disease in time and find out that in one case, it will get reach the peak in 42 days. And in the best case scenario, it uh, goes up to 132. We ask questions, will the disease be spread out more evenly? And the approximate results will tell us yes or no for that particular uh, um, case. Oh, but that's a good, too complicated. Couldn't you give me a different summary? Well, basically we use computers to imitate the pandemic. And once we do that, we do experiments and we learn new things about the pandemic. And that's a different summary from the one that I just said before. Someone could be thinking, wasn't that easier to say? No, not really. Thank you very much. I want uh, to thank, this is more or less the end of my presentation, but as you can figure out, I haven't done anything. I have a, a nice group of students that I supervise. They do all of the work and I take all of the credit. And uh, this is the team that's working in COVID. They range from very young co-op students that started working uh, in May up to my master's students PhDs, collaborators with uh, uh, the groups in architecture, and uh, our three postdocs that work in the model, in the, uh, sorry, in the project. So thank you very much. We have a lot of information in uh, our website. We have a bunch of videos in our YouTube uh, channel, and uh, we have a Twitter feed where we post uh, our news for, from the lab. That's all I have to say for today. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Weiner. Um, so we're just going to move into the Q&A portion now. So thank you to everyone that has submitted questions. And if you would like to still submit, there is time. Um, so first question, Dr. Weiner. So many epidemiological modelers in Canada and abroad use agent-based models to provide more detailed modeling than compartmental models normally provide. How does your cell model compare to agent-based models? What are the pros and cons compared to these models? So uh, 
you could see our, our spatial models as a kind of uh, agent-based models. Um, there are different kinds of agent-based models. There are some of them that we don't like at all. Uh, and there are some that we like. Uh, so why we don't like them? Because many of these models are pieces of software. Uh, this is what my research is about. If you get a piece of, if you get a model that it's really a simulation, it's not really a model. It's a, it's a bunch of code and some support to make that code work and to do the tests. Um, you lose a lot. Uh, we, we want a mathematical model to observe even before starting would be doing anything with software, okay? So um, what our uh, method allows you to do is to build something that is in a certain way, an agent-based model. You could program every single agent-based model that you have seen in the literature with our tools. And, but what many agent-based models cannot do is to introduce proper equations before you get started. Uh, you lose everything in the process when you move from the equations to the implementation in the agent base, because uh, well, there's there's a problem in semantics. There's a difference in semantics between the two techniques. So you are working in one semantic level, uh, and then you are going to move to a different one, and you lose in the process. Uh, verification and validation is way more complicated. Reuse of the models is hard. Uh, so if you see the people that work on agent based models, they spend tireless hours in uh, building the models and adapting them. And then reusability is in some cases reduced. So these are problems that the software engineering community resolved 30 years ago and the modeling and simulation community is resolving some of them. And uh, what I prefer is to have a method like the one that I uh, explained in which you move from the model, sorry, from the real world to the model from the model to the simulation. In our technique, you don't care about, the user doesn't care about the simulation, they care about the model. So if you have an expert in, in agent-based models, they can use our tools. Something else that's completely missing in the literature is something that I didn't have to, time to explain, is on the, on the left part of my diagram, there are these experimental frames. Uh, this is a, also a mess that people tend to neglect. Uh, so um, there, are, there are lots of advantages in our approach. I hope that that answered the first question. Perfect. Thank you. All right, next question. So is there simulation with some measure taking other than safe distance? For example, is there a risk score when masks are on while moving or any other scenarios that can inform decision makers of the best practices? Um, and I'm reading it here on the, on the side, okay, on the chat. Um, so, uh, so basically the result of every simulation is going to be uh, some kind of, uh, uh, of, of score, okay? Uh, once you have the simulation results, you need to do analysis of the results and there are well-defined techniques for that. There, uh, there are good methods for this. And what you do is you collect your simulation results, you feed it into one of these statistical tools and it will give you a number. Uh, so there are many different ways of doing this analysis. I showed a couple of, of them here, which are basically um, the, uh, the software tools that we have developed to trace these curves and, and do some kind of analytics. But um, so people in Public Health Canada have been using R for doing the, the to, do, to the analysis of the results uh, that you can use machine learning. And uh, so th that's a very particular topic that it's outside the scope of the current uh, research. Uh, probably uh, around February, March next year, we will be facing uh, these kind of questions as soon as we start doing proper validation of the results of this research. Um, and yes, you need to, uh, to come up with some kind of metric to do comparisons and uh, give it to the, uh, pra to, to the practitioners to, to make decisions. Okay. 
Um, how can we define the computation experimental frame by observing the modeling experimental frame? And then the second part to this question, is it possible to accur accurately predict events in the far future? Um, example, future events of COVID-19 a year from now, mm -hmm. if we collect more data and model more scenarios. Yeah, so um, the, the, the experimental frame, okay, to answer your question, I have one master's and one PhD trying to answer the first question, okay. So I have one person that has been working for a couple of years already and has probably a couple of extra to go. And now I have a new master's student who started working this year, uh, probably in one year, one and a half years, he will have uh, a, a good answer to this question. Uh, it's an open question. Um, so there has, there, ha, there, ha, there has been a lot of informal work. I also need to formalize that because um, if you see how things are done in, in, in the real world right now, you get your models, and people conduct experiments. There is no formalization on how the experiments are conducted. There is some kind of formalization, but we want to uh, formalize it in a different way using the methods that we use in the lab. Uh, so um, there, there has been some work, some related work, and we had a previous master's thesis with some implementation that helps to conduct experiments. Uh, the formalization from the uh, modeling experimental frame to the computational experimental frame uh, needs to be studied more seriously, and this is what we, we are doing right now. So that was question one. Uh, for question two, uh, yes, everything is possible, but again, remember that we start with collecting data. So for this virus, there is no data. We know nothing. One of the things that we don't know is if it's in, so if we get a vaccine, we're going to remain immune for how long is it going to, uh, uh, so uh, is, is there going to be a mutation in one year that's different from this one? And then we will need to start all over again. So uh, all of the models and the simulations are based on lots of uncertainty. And what we do in the lab is to try to provide tools to adapt quickly to, the, to these uncertainties. Uh, so when there is new research uh, proven, we can put it into our models quickly and conduct these experiments. So if someone comes with a mechanism for um, uh, predicting in one year, we can put it in the tools quickly. Uh, there are lots of things that needs to be studied. For instance, what's the influence between a model of the economy <clears throat> and the model of COVID? How do they affect each other? There are models on uh, the um, uh, um, effect of COVID to the economy and we have models of more advanced models on the disease. How do we mix those two? Those are also open problems that need to be resolved. Uh, and these are our interesting research problems. All right, um, so I think we have time for one more question. So has there been any conclusive concepts related to the number of people that can be in a proximity to minimize the curve? Uh, so, uh, any conclusive concepts related to the number of people that, um, uh, not really. So this is being studied every week. So I have not done any of these, uh, studies myself, uh, but I have read, uh, the Public Health Canada studies. They have been studying this for, for a couple of months now. And so basically what they do is, Probably you have read everywhere uh, this um, very uh, hot parameter that people try to compute, which is called the uh, R0, or more properly, the R, which is the rate of spread of the virus, that when it started, it was close to two to three, and we need to keep it below one. You heard Angela Merkel talking about this, and it was under one for a while in Ottawa, and it, it is around one in Ontario, in, in many places, it's under one. That means that the, the disease is, the, the, the pandemic is reducing and it might vanish. Um, 
And the first thing that they do is they compute the R number every week. And they give it to the government to decide what do we open, what do we keep closed. But a major uh, parameter that is computed is people can you get in touch with in a safe way, okay? And uh, this depends very seriously on uh, R not. The numbers were uh, around six people uh, a month ago, and it was 10 people last week. And it changes every week, and it depends on the discipline of the people and, and the cases that we have and the computation of this uh, R uh, parameter. But in the lab, we have not done that. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you once again for your presentation today. Um, very much appreciated. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Say, you are welcome. Um, thank you to everyone for taking the time to join us today. Um, so, yeah, first off, we hope you gained some valuable insight and information and enjoyed the conversation. Um, you'll see that a um, quick poll or survey has um, popped up on your screen. So if you do have the time to complete that right now, it's much appreciated, um, but we will be sending an email version um, to all that attended as well. And all answers are anonymous. anonymous. Okay. Um, also in the chat section, um, a few relevant links have been posted as well as um, the Twitter handle there. So that is just for your reference, okay? Um, and we hope that you enjoyed everything and keep well and hope to see you all again soon. Thank you.